Hello there and welcome to Racehorse Movies, the show where two film fans take a racing sheet from last week, pick a random horse name for each other and from that name pitch a movie. In the pitch, to flesh out our movie ideas, we may include such things as stars, directors, composers, best boys and stable boys. Maybe not that last one. Hoping none of our ideas have to be put behind a screen and shot. The sky's the limit, the horses are on the starting line, the jockeys are frothing. It's time for Racehorse Movies. Hello there, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Racehorse Movies. I am Luke Searle, and I am joined by my wonderful friend, uh, Graham Thomas. Hello, everybody. That's my cue. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. We have a couple of horses that we are really looking forward to uh, pitching for you guys. Mm. And uh, I guess before we do that, mm, drumming up anticipation mm. much, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to just have a little chat about Graham. How the devil are you, man? Catch up with me. We're going to have the Graham on? conversation. Yeah, well, no, I was born and I grew up and then... Uh, I'm well, man. I've been good. I've been working very, very uh, hard, I guess, Um at things that's disconcertingly vague isn't it Graham's no, a good. hitman think... when he's not podcasting by the way because you can get man. that from the vagaries uh... it's been a good nice few weeks just hunkering down in Fortress Never Press and getting on with work and seeing a few things seeing a few friends seeing some family but that's, uh, that's me rambling away. What about you? What have you been up to? Uh, I have been similarly hunkered, uh, getting on with a few things as well. Quite a lot of work at the moment. Um, being a little bit sad about the passing of a director that we have been sort of <sighs> shouting yes. shouting the praises of quite recently. Um, there was an echo, in fact, as I watched one of the <laughs> films that he did um, that you had watched earlier in the season and uh, effused about mm. him, man. It was a shame to see William, William Friedkin pass away. Um, yes, yes, it was. That came as a bit of a shock. Um, and I guess, I don't know, I don't think we should wait until someone passes away in order to dig into their back catalogue a little bit more. But I think I, I shall be doing that. There are certain films that he's made that I've just never got round to. Maybe it's because of the reputations that uh, they've borne, like films like Cruising, for example, I've never seen. <laughs> Funny you should mention, yep. So okay. um, I probably should yep. dig them out and... yep. Get a broader picture of the man's work. It's, it's going to be a pleasure to dive further into it. And weirdly enough, I've got cruising and to live and die in LA as a bit of a double this weekend with a good friend of mine. Nice. So to be, live and die in LA, LA is fantastic. I'm very excited with the very fresh-faced Willem Dafoe in it who looks Yes. Striking. It's really... I'd be interested, maybe the next episode... Or maybe we do a one shot. I don't know. Yep. But we'll have a bit of a freaking um, break. Freaking out. Uh, freaking breakdown. Yeah, we're freaking we'll out. Freaking, freaking out, man. Yes. We'll have a freaking breakdown and talk about uh, to live and die in LA because it is a curious beast. Okay. Well, I'm even more intrigued. Okay, well, um, listen out, uh, listeners. Uh, that might be mm -hmm. something that comes your way. We might do a little one-off uh, just celebrating a bit of the uh, sort of recent freaking watches that we've had. That sounds like a really good idea, Graham. Yeah, let's do that. Um, and yeah, other than that, I've been pooting along very nicely, very happily, and uh, got to see your fine self for, uh, for a watch, which we're probably going to segue perfectly into uh, as we talk about things we have watched. That is true. We're getting good at these Wogan links, aren't we? Mate, just give me give me that that wig and Nicholas Cage jumping onto my stage, throwing money, calling my audience wanker. <laughs> wanker. <laughs> yes, we went to see uh, Oppenheimer, didn't we? We did indeed. We went to see it at well, IMAX. The BFI IMAX, which is the best place to see it, I guess. I think that oh, I think that we would get the and then Nolan. We know Nolan is quite the taskmaster as to how his films are viewed. Mm -hmm. I think he would give us a terse nod of approval as we walked past him into the theatre. I'm tempted if I ever meet Christopher Nolan to congratulate him on Tenet and told, tell him that I watched it on an aeroplane just to see what would happen. <laughs> yeah, just be like, I just can't believe it worked like on such a tiny, fuzzy screen. <laughs> half of the screen had gum on. The other half was broken, Christopher. <laughs> but, but I still got the, the full majesty experience. of your vision. <laughs> it spoke through the gum, the crack, the tiny, <laughs> tiny sound system. <laughs> It doesn't matter how much crack you take, that film does not speak <laughs> to anyone on any level. It is rubbish. Yeah, and sorry to begin a, uh, sorry, uh, talking about Oppenheimer with tearing down his last movie, but I think that does bear some uh, significance to the conversation, actually, because mm. that kind of hits uh, my level of expectancy as I was going in. Um, mm. Yes, what me too. I was um, hoping to get compared to maybe what I thought he would deliver. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. And it's great to see it in the IMAX. It was super loud. I wasn't I wasn't um lost in the sound mix or well, the dialogue wasn't lost in the sound mix as sometimes they can it can be in his films. I 
I was on board with it. It was good. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah, if, I well don't want to say like, grown up, but it did feel grown up. Apart from, oh yes, don't do sex scenes, please, Christopher Nolan, because it feels yes. like a robot or alien telling me how people have sex, and yeah, it, it really weird. breaks some walls and throws me out of the movie yeah. a little bit. It was just the weird POV dream sequence of Ellie. in the in the interrogation room. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Of him, of. Florence Pugh's character and um, Killing Murphy having sex. It just seems so out of place. Because that's the first and only time in that film we ever got anything from anyone else's point of view. Yes, yeah, yeah, very weird. Than Oppenheimer's, I think. It just seemed so jarring. But it didn't know. work for me. It just felt really odd. I don't think it went. It came out of nowhere. It was very sideswiping. Um, and it, yeah, it just felt... I don't know. Was it supposed to be scary? Was it supposed to be dramatic? Was it supposed to be sad? Was it supposed to be erotic? But other than that, it was a an absolute tour de force in filmmaking. Yeah, and uh, I didn't even think about the explosion itself, which is not the reason to watch the film, because the film is the reason to watch the film, but the explosion itself, how that was created and how oh, that so was good. shot uh, and how it made me feel and also the sort of sense of dread that I found peppered throughout. And when I came out of that film, I was affected and I was unsettled mm. and I felt a bit scared and that wasn't mm -hmm. what I was expecting going into it. So again, it was a really nice surprise for that as well. And I was feeling things again coming out of Nolan, not just yeah. like, oh, wonder, he showed me buildings folding in on themselves. It was, <laughs> was oh, yeah, it was a really affecting film in that way. Um, so that was what we've been doing. I think we'll, maybe we'll do another one shot because there's lots of things I want to talk about, other films that have come out of things that I've yeah, seen, yeah, but yeah, we haven't really list, got but time. But we're going to crack on, we're going to give you guys the goods. We've got, a, we got Floyd is up there, Aiken to hit that Aiken. green play button, uh, which he we know. He wants the green play button and then go on a cigarette break. Yeah, exactly. So let's let's uh, enable our poor Floyd. He's earned it, man. And let's, uh, let's invite you all into it. our mind cinema because the shutters are up and we are ready. Let's do this. So then, we are at the starting line, but we are at the starting line of what race and whereabouts is it? This is the 225... I went very uh, smashy and nicely there, I do apologise. <laughs> this is, is back from coming at you guys, drive. you'll never believe, from the 225 at Goodwood. Uh, but it is the Good 225 word. at Goodwood. <laughs> it's like someone's hooking the back of the epiglottis. Uh, yeah, the 225 at Goodwood. Um, a fine race. Uh, we had quite a bunch of runners in there, actually. We had a good selection to choose from this week. 13 in total, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and who did you give me, Graham? I gave you the mighty steed, White Moonlight. Uh, indeed. And, and very muscular are its forelocks, mm. if indeed that's possible with a horse. I don't know. Do they have forelocks? Maybe fetlocks. Fetlocks, because they blow in the wind. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, of course they do, flippin' egg, right. Uh, and for you, uh, in return, I mm -hmm. gave you uh, Sicilian Defence. Um, and you I did. do believe, without getting all uh, authoritarian on your ass, uh, that mm -hmm. I went first last time, so I'd like to extend that courtesy to you this time, if, uh, if you're prepared and all set, mate. All right, Sicilian Defence. I came very close to doing what I shouldn't have done with this. And I didn't do it. I kind of wish <laughs> I, I was going to do because when you said Sicilian defense, that was like we both laughed about it previously. Immediately in my head, I just started writing a prequel to The Princess Bride oh, mate, based on uh, Vicini. Yeah, and it was him. I, I have, this isn't the pitch, by the way. <laughs> and um, it was uh, <laughs> a mashup of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, The Princess Bride, obviously, and Titus Groan stroke Gormenghast. So it was like. <laughs> <laughs> young Vicini inside this big castle as like a low level uh, a low level schmuck, schmuck or bottom. something yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 and through his, uh, his own yeah. brilliance he gets us away through this huge big conspiracy or whatever something uh, massive is going on in the castle he just manages to get his way through it in a kind of Machiavellian way and gets <laughs> yeah, the end. yeah 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 and like escapes with Fezzig or something like that man yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, but I'm not going to do that. Okay, well, look, okay. that was a beautiful... We just got a trailer for the Mint 9. You got a trailer, got yeah. there, So I appreciate that, man. And now our main feature. The main feature. This is my pitch. This is my pitch for Sicilian defence. We start underwater looking up. And above the water, we can see fire floating in the water. Some dappled light. Some men splashing in. 
maybe some arrows coming in. Voiceover. <laughs> I've written a voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> so slow motion, you can slow motion, you can imagine like the flames licking all this inferno licking across the surface of this water. Yeah, you've got the water, the flames, you've got yeah. the... <laughs> yeah, the arrows again. going into the water. Exactly. Voiceover. Old man's voice, so I'm quite suited to this. Not an old Joe Pasquale, an old me. Oh, like, <laughs> well, I <see> you. <laughs> <laughs> like an old old Pasquale. 20 years ago, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Bottle T Fords on every corner. <laughs> I was having me an ice cream float. No, the voiceover is not like that. It's an older dude, and I'll, do, I'll play it seriously because it's a serious. It's a serious film. He came first to destroy us. He came on the breath of a thousand ships, the burning heart of all of Rome, come to overrun Syracuse, to turn our Greek hearts to the Roman bosom. They came from Rome, but he came as death. Nobody lives now who remembers him, except me. I knew him. I stood beside the man who sailed the oceans, naming himself as death. But we didn't come to call him death. In the end, we came to call him father. Directed by Ridley Scott. <laughs> 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 exactly. <laughs> so we come from that opening scene, opening shot, close up of a chess game, swaying, creaking mm. of a ship, close on the chessboard. The king is knocked over, and a laugh from a from a man. We pan up, and pro consul Marcus Marcellus laughs and asks how his opponent always manages to beat him. And his opponent, Gaius Corvinus, a youngish man in maybe mid-thirties, just says skill, luck, determination, and a willingness to see the battle to the end. And then Marcus Marcellus leads Gaius out onto the deck of the ship and we pan across and we have the big opening vista of a thousand yes, Roman ships yes. all coming along, coming towards the beach and ahead, the walled city of Syracuse. Title card, simply Syracuse, 1213 BC. Gaius surveys the scene and Marcellus asks him, how does it feel to see your home? And Gaius says, I was a baby when I left here. The city is nothing. Rome is my heart and Rome is my home. And then on, the, on their deck, there's a commotion from below decks and a soldier comes up and says, Gaius, Gaius, your brother. And Gaius takes his leave of Marcellus and goes down uh, onto the decks and there, cooped up with all the men rowing at the back in the corner, there's this hulk of a, of a dude and he's screaming and he's panicked. He's almost kind of like a child, just in fear and it's hot and he's sweating and uh, Gaius comes up to him and calms him and takes him out onto the deck, onto the upper deck and the guy stands tall next to him. He's like a big six foot two Pretty big built dude, oh, yeah, typical brute. Ben Affleck kind of oh, Henry Cavill type. Oh, I just want to watch brute. this guy doing some pull ups, man. Please, I mean, yeah, sorry. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, carry on. Sorry. <laughs> and yeah, and Gaius says to this this dude, "Are you okay?" He says, "It's it's getting close. I'm coming close to to this city. There's a darkness in me. There's a fear. I don't like the dark, and I don't like this dark." And Gaius pats him on the shoulder and he says, "There, big brother." There is the heart of your rage pointing out towards Syracuse. Okay. Go towards it as death. And then Gaius takes uh, his brother, who's called Aloysius, Aloysius, sorry. He takes his hand, and on his hand he has a special signet ring. And his brother kisses the signet ring and thanks him for standing beside him, his younger brother, yeah. and Rome one more time. And then we get into the Saving Private Ryan oh, style. Oh, yes. Beach okay. front assault. The boats land. Oh, everybody overboard, the spears and ballistas on the boats firing. Obviously, the people of Syracuse are, are ready for this. Everything's going, bells are ringing in the, in the city and um, really quite modern defences because um, in the, the, the siege of Syracuse, it was defended by lots of um, 
machines that were designed by Archimedes who lived there. So these very really powerful strains like trebuchets and oh, ballistas and stuff. Like giant that would crossbows, sort of like, things like that. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to heighten up the fantasy a, a, a little bit and imagine these like really strange weapons of war that they haven't been encountered. So there's this crazy first siege, beachfront assault, brave fighting from everybody, including Gaius as the master strategist. He's getting involved in the fray. Um, and many boats are getting lost from the the shells that are coming over. Yeah, uh, the Greek Greeks come out onto the beach. Brutal, brutal fights. And uh, Elysia, uh, Elysius is fighting like Achilles. He's just like laying waste. He's a big dude, but he's not like the Hulk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's like he's like Thor or something. Yep. Yeah, and he's just charging up the beach. Big. Short, sharp opening battle scene. Yep. You know, not this huge, but it's just a very violent. Bam! Boats have landed. Yeah, the beach is secured, and then we cut to nighttime. The brothers and the generals are all drinking and they're talking of these defenses that they've seen. Like that was pretty crazy, but we're here now, and don't worry. Aloysius says to the generals, like, "I'm here for war." Gaius himself, the young <laughs> brother, says, "Yeah, I'm here for war, but I'm going head to head with Archimedes because I'm the strategist. He's the strategist." He's safe in his walled cities. I've travelled with Rome all around the world. I've de- I've come up against everybody. I've defeated them all. This is just another man who's seventy eight years old. It's shock and awe. That's Gaius's kind of when he's playing chess. That's kind of his tactic: is shock and awe. So Gaius and um, Alasius leave the generals to their their reverie, and they go out onto the beach as brothers, and they kind of stand there at the night, looking at the dead and the dying, and they privately talk about their connection to the city, of which Gaius has no real memory. He was a baby when they left. Alasius has only just only feels anger towards it. He can't remember. He just feels anger. He remembers only darkness, and he just he says to him privately, "I fear that darkness, brother." And as they're talking, they observe on the battlefield young children scampering out from the walls of the city to collect up the dead Mm -hmm. and the dying and ferry them back in. And they see a young boy sees a badly injured Roman soldier who's left for dead, and the boy tries to help him, and some drunk Romans try to attack the boy, but Elisus steps in and he saves it, breaks it all up, and he dismisses the drunk soldiers. And the boy pleads with Elysius to let him take that Roman inside the city to where there's hospitals and he can be treated. Elysius says that the soldier is a citizen of Rome. He, he knew what he was getting himself in for. He's mortally wounded. He is to die on the battlefield because that is where he laid and that is, you know, he died for glory. He's beyond medicine. So he dismisses the boy, pushes him away and he goes back and he talks to, to Gaius on the, on the sand dunes. And then over the shoulders we see the little boy sneak back and he drags the Roman back inside, he hmm. takes him inside the town. So and then the next day or the next few days later, Marcellus, um, Marcus Marcellus, who was a proconsul, he was a, he's a real person. He was the proconsul who led the siege of um, Syracuse. Okay. So proconsul Marcus Marcellus and, and his council debate on the next steps. And some of them are petitioning for a protracted siege to starve them out. Gaius wants another assault. He's like, no, we, we're here, man. Let's just hammer them. Mm-hmm. Get it, get it done. And some say, no, we, we waste them out, let's waste them out. Marcellus questions the need for another assault. And is this for Rome or do you just want to utterly beat Archimedes? And Guy says, well, can it not be both? <laughs> <laughs> A long siege favours Syracuse because they're well stocked and they can get resupplies from Carthage, which will come eventually. And when the resupplies come, we have to fight that front as well. So Gaius with his his... Uh, reasoning kind of sways yeah, the console. Best to not leave the wounded bear. Like, yeah, just go at it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So he says, this is my plan, and he, he shows them his new plan for the next phase of assault, which is uh, the siege, siege towers on the beach, and they're going to do. They're going to sail around to the port on the side, and they're going to attack with, um, with their boats, with the especially modified boats that... I think they actually had, but Gaius has modified, which have got their own siege towers on it. So they can, so these indefensible walls that were almost sheer at the port can now be breached. Yeah, yeah, yep. And Marcellus and everyone are like, okay, we're in. And Elise says, okay, well, I'm going to need, I want to lead this. No, I'm going for it. Can I have a crew of chosen men? Yes. And um, Elise says, yes, you can. <laughs> yes, yes, you can. Please do. Take your pick, bro. <laughs> Yeah, so we have like a a Richard Sharp kind of oh, a gang of chosen men, right? 
The dig. You've already so, you started me with Ridley Scott, and then and then you you've refluffed me with with, <laughs> with with Richard Sharp. Wow, this is excellent. Right, sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Carry on with this uh, siege. Yeah. So second second siege, Alasius and his crew, his chosen men, are at the forefront. It's brutal action of you know siege towers going up, ladders, people trying to scale the wall. Gaius sends his boats around to the port with high towers, high siege towers attached to these boats ready to breach. Full on assault. The, the Romans are going for it. <laughs> this is a big scaling up in action from what we had yep. previously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. This, is, this is the payoff for the taste we got at the start. Yes. Yeah, yeah. this is like Helm's Deep kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, the older brother, Alicius, and his team managed to breach the walls. Many, uh, many soldiers don't. Many ladders get knocked down. but They fight up on their siege tower or their ladder. Yeah. And they get over the wall, and, and the battle on both fronts is going well until <laughs> the arrival of a mythical, semi-mythical weapon called Archimedes' Claw, which was deployed at Syracuse <laughs> for my scant Wikipedia research. And this was a kind of, it was a... On the port, it was this defence, this weapon that was mounted to the walls. They called it Archimedes Claw. It's almost like a depth-charging hammer, I guess. And it swings down and it punches the deck of boats and it slams boats deep into the water. And it can can pull them back out and they just shatter. And they've got these big... Archimedes claws, they were called. See, what I was imagining in my head, I was imagining like those fairground claw machine things just Why coming not? down and plucking <laughs> men off of the battlefield. <laughs> yeah. And Archimedes is up in the tower with a couple of uh, levers, you know. I think it's a similar kind of thing in that it can, it was designed, it could pull boats out that of the water. That must have been absolutely terrifying. That's, abs- yeah, imagine that's, that. that's a horrific idea. Sweet Jesus. Yeah. So that's kind of swings... Everything's going quite well for the Romans at this point, right? and then this happens. Yeah, I want to see like the big unveiling and like big chains clanking. What the, yeah, what the hell is that? Bam! And um, all these boats are sinking around the port, which turns the tide of the action. The Romans are getting a total shoeing, and Gaius is in absolute shock. Um, he did not account on the ingenuity of the seventy-eight-year-old Archimedes yeah, yeah, yeah. and the experience that uh, his great mind brought to this. We cut to Alicius and his team of chosen men o- who are over the wall now and they're fighting valiantly in, in the cities but um, with all the stuff going on, maybe like buildings are falling down or carnage everywhere and they get separated from the main pack so they get cut off deep behind enemy lines. They're trapped. Jesus. They're fighting hard through the streets. Uh, they don't know where's left and where's right. They're just running through this yeah. rabbit war and getting attacked from all sides because it's a siege. And they're cornered, and the team, one of the members of the team, I don't have names of the team members, but it's yeah, fine. fine. The team members. is good. Yeah. The team, one of them um, opens up a massive grate into a sewer. So, like, get in the sewers, we're going to go yeah, underground. Yeah. So, they all like pile in, except for obviously Elise's can't go into the sewer. It's dark. He's scared oh, of the dark. He's mate. in this, like, he can't go in. He's just absolutely frozen. So, what he does, and so he kind of has a flip out, and instead he forces them all in and says, I'm right behind you, and just slams the gate shut, and he just defends it. He's, the brave, he's having a brave fight, and he's about to be totally overrun when the building he's next to, like the, I don't know, the wooden awning collapses mm-hmm. on him, and they all kind of <laughs> fall down, and they just. Done, and that's the dum, 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 end of the end of the scene kind of thing, you know. It's all building up, dude. That's dude, your scene and drums. drums are just so on point. Dum, it's hurting dum, me. <laughs> and scene ends black as they as he gets flattened by the awning. Darkness. End of oh, the scene. Yeah. Act two. Devastation at the Roman camp. So many ships lost. Demoralized men. Yeah. Gaius is in his tent alone, staring at the chess set in despair, just trying to figure out what the hell went wrong. How did it come to this? Marcus Marcellus enters and rages at Gaius, and and he's extolling the brilliance and power of Archimedes and how he's bested Gaius, like, at both turns now, and the waste of men and resources. Then cut to you, um, Alicius wakes up, opens his eyes, and he's in a strange hospital. People moaning in pain, doesn't really know where he is. He's kind of... And he sees, like, this field hospital in the middle of the city, yeah. very ramshackled. There's young, there's the old, there's Romans, there's Greeks, there's men, there's women. Everyone's equal in their pain and misery and suffering. Yeah. And then a young boy called Lucius uh, comes, over, comes over to Elysius and dabs his head with water. And Elysius grabs his arm and demands to know where he is. And then he hears a Roman voice, or someone speaking, 
Italian, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's heard. And he's just really like talking in, in V's and I's. And <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an asterisk book. And a, uh, and a gentle hand releases his grip on Lucius. And Alasius um, wipes his eyes and he sees that the boy is the boy from the beach. Yeah. And the voice that he heard was the soldier that he rescued. And the soldier that the boy rescued was a medic. And that's one of the reasons why the boy saved him. And now he he says, "In this is my second life. I died for Rome on that battlefield. And now I've been saved by this boy. And now my duty is to care for all. Oh, we cut back to uh, Marcellus and Gaius. And Marcellus demands Gaius accept defeat. And they must now change tact from all out attacking and lay siege. And to his chagrin, he accepts it, and they start laying preparations for for a long, drawn out siege. Now, back to Lysias goes to Lucius, the young boy, and he apologizes yeah. for his brutish behavior when he grabbed his hand. He thanks him for saving him and for saving the Romans. And they have a little tour of the hospital, and, and you know, Lysias learns about what they're doing there and and the, how their supplies are so low. But don't worry, supplies will come. Because yeah. then we cut to the chosen men who are still behind enemy lines. Of course, they're deep in the sewers. They're deep yeah. in the sewers. They're behind enemy lines. So they decide, okay, well, our job as soldiers, and our job is to come here and kill Greeks. So we are now going to form a guerrilla team, and we're just going to stay behind enemy lines, and we're just going to fuck shit up. So we've got these, um, these gnarly dudes, these chosen men, um, a ragtag group. Obviously, they might just like dis- obviously get rid of their armour and, and don. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, They're going to disguise up and stuff, yes. Hidden, wep- hidden weapons as they go around marketplaces, killing important people like um, a baker so he can't make bread. For the, oh, you know, poor baker! They, <laughs> I know, poor baker. I know. Or they might they might smash up things for milling wheat or whatever, or they yeah, just yeah, yeah, fuck yeah, it up. Yeah, They're just, just like the baker's morning. Baker. He's having like the best morning of the world. He's like, <laughs> oh, just, I love you, my beautiful children in this really city that's so safe. <laughs> and then knife the on shot the would be the shot would be a lovely pile of like muffins, <laughs> and the last one goes on, and off screen you hear a <laughs> and then a splat of blood over the muffins. <laughs> That would be that would be part of a montage. Right? <laughs> Definitely. Blood splats over. So it's kind of a period of time now is going to take place while Ulysses is regrouping or recuperating, learning about the hospital. Yeah. They're messing shit up. We see um Gaius preparing for a siege and uh Elysius back in the hospital, he's he's getting better. But mm-hmm. to draw inspiration from that wonderful um mantra from Arnold Schwarzenegger, stay busy, be useful. So Elysius is helping out um, with the hospital. He's like help repairing it when he's repairing, strengthening when it needs strengthening. Yeah. Um, and Lucius asks while he's working away. Lucius, who's very curious about um, Elysius, because he's seen he's seen him fighting. He's seen this great warrior. Now he's seeing kind of a strange, almost tender. And Lucius um, sees the signet ring on his on his finger, and he asks it what it means. And Elysius says that he's an evocatus, which was a soldier who's done his tours of duty and has been honourably discharged to a life of freedom, but has volunteered to come back. Lucius says, you know, what did you do after you you stopped being a soldier? And he says, I went and I built a home and I wanted to fill it with a wife and children, but none came. And instead... A war came. Back to the beach. As we mentioned before, Gaius is getting pretty fervent in re-attacking the city, <laughs> se- secretly designing weird and wonderful counter weapons to breach the walls, trying to match Archimedes' power. While this is happening, the re- the uh, resupply or reinforcements and resupplies from Carthage come, which actually happened, and they were f- they were beaten back by Marcellus and the troops. And the hospital scene, because the resupply was for the city was so meagre, nothing's even got to their secret hospital, and they realise now the siege is going to end with them all dying. It's the only way now. Yeah. And they've, they're going to have to, at some point, the walls will be breached, the city is going to be sacked, they're going to have to have some kind of get out, some kind of escape route. Yeah, yeah. Lucius suggests that the only way out, really, is the sewers, because I know them so well. I'm a child, and these the other children here know the sewers. Obviously, Elysius votes that they, sh- if they were to fight their way out, they should do it on ground level. Um, but he's overruled, and he says, you know, if you go down to the sewers, you're all going to die, but it's not up to me to decide because I'm a Roman. Mm-hmm. And he packs his bags to leave. 
Lucius stops Alicius from leaving and he asks him why. Like, why are you so scared of this? Why can you not go into the sewer? Why can you not help us? Yeah. And Elysius, Elysius confesses to Lucius that when that he was born in Syracuse, he's actually Greek himself. Um, during the first Punic War, the siege of Syracuse, we're at is the second Punic War. There was one about 30 years before. Yeah. And Gaius was a young baby, too young to remember. Um but I, I remember it, and we were attacked. So our, our whole family was killed, and I held on to the little boy, and I hid inside a crate, mm. and I could see through the cracks the horror and carnage of everything. And we were discovered in that crate, and I remember the lot. One of the last things I remember of this city is the sound of nails in that crate being nailed shut, and then they were taken over the seas, beaten and starved and broken until all he knew was the might and light and the glory of Rome. Yeah. And to this day, I fear the dark. Something about the city that called me back to war and I named myself as death because I've come here to destroy this city because the dark, my fear of the dark is overwhelming. I can't go down into that, the sewers where you're electing to take people. I can't go down there. Yeah. But I can help you. Before I leave, I can help you. So he and Elysius, they bond a little bit. They sit down and they start building little models. Mm. And he shows them how to build like a little pulley system and some little things like a portcullis, little booby traps, yeah, little things yeah. that, they, that they can set. But you, can't, you just can't go down into the, yeah. the yeah, yeah, depth I'll, and darkness. I'll give you the knowledge to make you as safe as I can. That's all yeah. I can do. Cut to the chosen men, the guerrilla team. They realise that this is effective, but what they really need is a symbol. They need a symbolic yeah, death. They need something to turn the tide. Yeah. So we need to find out where Archimedes is. Oh, God, and we need we, we need to take him out. So that knowledge and them going about trying to find a secret lab, if he has a secret a lab, secret lab. <laughs> <laughs> Dexter <laughs> bubbling away with Igor and stuff like that. <laughs> now live! Um, so what we, we might have, I'd like to speed things up in the film, while Elysius is telling... Lucius about his history or why he's there, why they're there. Yeah, yeah. That. It's intercut with a silent montage of the guerrilla team, the chosen men, going about their actions, trying to shake down people to find out where Archimedes' secret lab, <laughs> secret lab is. It's definitely a secret lab. So they're nearly there. They find out the location, but then the chosen men, they're attacked. One gets separated, or they all get separated, and one gets injured, and um, he gets left behind, left for dead, I guess. Okay. The chosen men, the ones that are remaining, they rally themselves together and they decide, like, we know where it is, but this is getting out of hand. We need reinforcements to okay. get to Archimedes' place. So we know where it is. We've got the intel. So let's just get back over the wall, get to the line, and then regroup, tell Gaius or whomever mm -hmm. what, the, what the plan is, and then come back with the full might of Rome. Um, so obviously the injured chosen man is brought to the hospital where he can't believe that he's found Elysius alive. Um, and now that with he's on their side, they're reunited, they'll surely have victory. But Elysius says, you know, my place is with the hospital. And I've just written dude, he could have any name, I'm going to call him dude. <laughs> it's about D-O-O-D-E, like, uh, like in the Roman way. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes, Dudas. <laughs> Dudas Chillus, um, understand. <laughs> Radus Dudas Chillis understands, <laughs> um, but he, he rests. He doesn't really understand. He just says, yeah, whatever, mate. So the guerrilla team, the, the chosen men under cover of darkness, get across the lines, the siege lines, to the Roman camp, and they're reunited with Gaius. And they confirm Elysius' sacrifice, because obviously they don't know that he's alive. They just saw him sacrifice. They just saw him die a two sieges back, or whenever it was. Yeah. And they tell of his glorious sacrifice and their amazing guerrilla campaign that they've waged on their own behind enemy lines and the, the Greeks that they've killed. Uh, the bakers, the butchers, the candlestick makers, all laid to waste. Obviously, this fills Gaius with pride and it really stirs Marcellus. And the, <laughs> um, the chosen men also reveal they know where Archimedes is. And Gaius uses this to muster enough support for a final assault for Rome, for Elysius, for death. And cut back to Elysius in the hospital. He's haunted at night. He has a dark dream about his childhood. And the dream ends with the crate lid being nailed shut. And he wakes up in fear, looking around. And he just sees six strangers. And he feels alone. And then he looks at his evocatus, evocatus ring, the signet ring on his finger. And he decides, OK. So he wakes up the dude, Dudas, Chillis, and says, <laughs> that I, I'll, I'll go with you. 
you're right, I'm going to go with you. I know the darkness is overwhelming and I know that I'm going to die in Syracuse and if I'm going to die in Syracuse and if he is still alive, I'll die beside my brother, Gaius, and I'll die beside my brothers in arms, my Roman brothers in arms. Yeah. So Elysius and the dude sneak away from the hospital morning, a glorious, cloudless, bright sunlight morning. Gaius is suiting up for the final battle. Marcellus comes to the camp and addresses the chosen men. He states that when they make it over the wall, like, sack the city. Anything goes. Like, this has gone too far. And obviously the chosen men are like, we're all good. And everyone out and all the soldiers are rallied and it's great. And then Marcellus takes Gaius aside and tells him under no certain terms, which actually happened, that Archimedes is not to be harmed Mm -hmm. because his skill and his ingenuity must be preserved for the might of Rome Yeah, because he is by far the smartest person. Yeah, they're going to Operation Paperclip him, man. Yeah, exactly. We need him. Yep. Don't touch. And, of course, Gaius says, yeah, of course, he promises. And my Marcellus <laughs> Fingers leaves. crossed behind his back. Fingers crossed behind yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Marcellus leaves, and then Gaius seething flips over that chest set. It's like, yeah. fuck this, it's over. Yeah. So then we go into Act 3, the final big siege battle. Okay, crikey. Bigger than anything okay. we've had before, right. because everyone's sent in. The city doors open and the Greeks pour out. So we'll have, you know, ballistas, onages from the boats and from the city, no inches given by either side, just fucking chaos. So Elysius and, and Dudas obviously are on the other side of the city walls <laughs> yeah, where they can see everything. And Dudas is compelling Elysius to, to get over the wall and rejoin the Romans. And he's looking around, Elysius is looking around and seeing all the death and destruction. He's seeing the city being torn apart. And he's about to go when he sees... Um, Maybe he sees an old woman or someone gets struck down by an arrow that comes over the wall. Or maybe the wall is breached and people are coming in now. And he makes a choice then and he saves the civilian, takes the woman and then like runs off back into the city to take them or to try and corral people to the hospital to make safe the citizens. He's made his decision now. Yeah, yeah. And then the um, Dudas is like, what the fuck is doing? he's doing? And maybe he like gets a bow and arrow and he's going to shoot him in the back or something. But then... A blinding flash of light, like white out. <laughs> and everyone's like, what the fuck? Everyone's shielding their eyes. They can't believe what happened. And then we see you on a very, very tall tower mm-hmm. right above the city. A ginormous, ginormous mirror is refracting the sunlight oh, into, mate. into a giant heat oh death God. ray. <sighs> That is now. Wait, this is myth. This I'm going to say this actually happened because there are like Archimedes claw. There are there is a myth that Archimedes created a refracting death ray on the top of Syracuse to refract man. sunlight down and burn the sails of the ships. How cool is that, right? That's incredible. So, That's absolutely incredible. I'm a glasses wearer. I used to try and do this with grass in the garden and things. Uh, yeah. Like, oh my goodness, man. So he does this. Um, so, yeah, we see this mirror and we see these ships suddenly just burst oh, into flames. Oh, goodness me, man. We're going to heighten the fantastical element of it. Maybe the death ray is, like, sweeping across the beach. Yeah, yeah, that's why I can see... Burning people yeah, up. Yeah, and... yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's like the worst dragon you have ever fought. It's... Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gaius and his crew get over the wall and they can't... Gaius is just... Mind is blown in the worst way possible. He must possible be so angry. Now, <laughs> he's so angry and lost and... I can't believe this is happening. I'm lost. But he's over the wall now. So, like, the, the bloodlust and the madness and the chaos of seeing this effectively a dragon just lay waste to yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. It's got to him. So, then we get into the, um, the basically the sacking of the city. So, we're over the wall now. All the Romans are piling in. Everything's going amok. Gaius is leading the charge. It's absolute chaos. But Gaius and the chosen men are like an arrow through all this chaos because they've got somewhere to be, which is Archimedes' studio secret lab. Yeah. So they're, they're fighting their way through up to the observatory. They're making a beeline for it where the death ray is. And they bust in, and this is also true. Archimedes was killed by a Roman soldier in that battle who either didn't know who he was yeah. or didn't give a fuck what about the orders. He just runs him through in real life, despite the actual orders to protect, to protect him. So they're going to bust in and maybe the chosen men is like, we've got him, we're going to take him back. And Gaius is like, no, not have anything. And just yeah, yeah, like a real blunt death with no glory, no honour, nothing like that. He just hacks him down or just runs him through. Yeah, the most pyrrhic of victories yes. for, for, for our boy. Yeah. Yeah. 
And he's done that. And as he's done that, Studas comes into the observatory because he just catches up to them. And obviously he says, oh, my God, you guys, guys, your brother is alive. But he's gone. He's gone mad. He's killing Romans. He's saving people. He's not himself. He's killing Romans. My brother lives. Take me to him. No, don't. So then that that beeline now steams towards the the hospital. And we'll have, um, when we get to the hospital, like random Romans are attacking it as they're attacking everything. And the medic and um, Elisa are fighting them off. Maybe the medic and gets dies and yeah yeah he, the, yeah he should do because we we've had some touching nods between the two and a really terse yeah. like love has occurred <laughs> i can tell yeah, exactly. even though there's a couple I'm of nods and some yes. eyebrows yep and then he dies and he says like thank you for standing behind me brother or get as many out of here as you can that kind of thing and then the yeah, yeah. at least it's defense 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 and then then the chosen men and, and guys come and they're like i can't believe he's standing there on this side Elisa says, like the younger brother, Gaius says, like, come with us, brother. You can't, don't let us fight you. Don't let us take you out because you are... Do not make me raise a sword against you, brother. I make you do nothing. (laughs) Can we uh, we do it in Fassbender voices? In uh, Papa Quick voices? (laughs) Don't make me... Do not not raise a sword to me, brother. (laughs) (laughs) And then Elisa says, I came here, I came as death to Syracuse. But all this time I was fighting myself, fighting against my past and my home, which is Syracuse. So the younger brother and the older brother will have a fight. Oh, sword fighty, sword fighty, sword fighty. Heavens to goodness, yeah. And then um, the younger brother, Gaius, maybe gets defeated. Yeah. So the younger brother comes to his senses and, and he and the chosen men realise and they turn and they stand beside Elysius and they defend the bloodlust ravages that are the Roman soldiers who are running amok and they defend the hospitals so that they can escape. So Lucius and everyone are funneling the sick and the dying down towards the sewer and yeah. Elysius and um, Gaius are defending so they can get away. Gaius gets struck down, maybe some arrows hit him. He dies very valiantly. The chosen men die very, very valiantly. And now it's just Elysius and he gets beaten back to the edge of the sewers. He's the last man there and he jumps into the sewer despite his fear. He's fighting super, super bravely as Lucius and the sick and the dying are going off down into the tunnels. And then the last we see, um, Lucius and Elysius are separated by the portcullis Mm -hmm. and Lucius cuts the, the cord and the cullis comes down, separating the sick and the dying away from the tunnel so they're safe. And Lucius looks at him and they don't share any words. He just sees the look in Elysius' eyes that this is my time, I'm going to die underground in the darkness of Syracuse, my home. And he rushes off back into the tunnel and we see like silhouettes of him just getting overrun by all the army, just getting cut down really valiantly and bravely. Can we get him to give uh, Lucius his ring before he does that? Oh, yes, yeah, nice. Through the bars of the... uh, Through the bars, he can hand him the ring. Done. Fade out, fade back into the sick walking out of the city and all around them there's dead soldiers and... Um, you know, crows are eating Roman and Greek alike because the crows don't care about the dead. And we're close in on the young boy as he looks down and we push in on the young boy's eyes and then the VO comes back Mm -hmm, and he mm. says, (laughs) I am old now and alive. Those who survived moved on, struggled, scattered, settled and endured. His history did not fall into legend. They did not sing songs of his name. He fell from memory, except from mine. I live on and soon I will fall like the autumn leaves. Gone and with me his legend. But I will take it with me to the other side to tell those that are dead about him, about the man who arrived as death, but stayed and became our father. A Ridley Scott film. <laughs> yes <laughs> that was my huge epic pitch for Sicilian defense mate you gave me an epic I did not expect an epic from Sicilian swords and sandals defense. swords and Man. sandals <laughs> oh dude wow <laughs> You gave me drums. You get, dude. I had like you. You <laughs> drummed at the end of every act. <laughs> this is just. Oh, that was perfect. That's the theme throughout the film. We'll have like them. Doing, that's the main theme. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hands is not going to have to work too much, man. But no. it will be effective. Hands. God damn it, <laughs> mate. Oh dear. I, I re- that was that was that was epic. It was in every sense of the word. You gave me a laser. You gave me yeah. 
and I mean, if you, I did scant research. There's some movements that are <laughs> like, accurate. Did Google, did Archimedes have a big laser? <laughs> <laughs> did, did he have a death ray? <laughs> yes, he <you> did. <laughs> Why would you not put a death ray in your film? Oh but apparently, God, yeah, man. he did. Peter Jackson came to mind at some point. Um, I did. I was thinking about Peter Jackson, actually, but... I don't know where, but I was thinking I'd like an Ian McShane in there somewhere because I just want to see him... In robes. Yeah, and I think, like, maybe Marcus, maybe, as a... Yeah, I don't Marcus know how Marcellus. old he was sure. meant to be, but, like, uh, I was thinking maybe him. He's pretty old. And it's I mean, like, there's, no, there's no pictures of him. He can be where he <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a few there flattering There might be an age. Carvings. Maybe he's in his 50s or 60s. I do not know. But, no, yeah, okay, Ian okay, McShane is matter. Marcus Marcellus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, sorry, anyway, I'm going to shut up. Tell me about your casting. Mm. Tell me about your thoughts, man. We've I don't really have too much casting. Sure. I would like for Elysius, I'd like Henry Cavill. Oh. I can imagine with the, cur- the curly, or the cropped hair, sorry, the, the red cape, the swords, the sand. Obviously, he can do all the action. He's a hulking... Behemoth. Massive behemoth, but also quite, I can imagine him quite lethal and agile. Um, but I think he could, he, I think he could do the... The troubled tenderness. And happy. Imagine the first smile we see on his face at, uh, uh, say, hour, probably hour, like 1.45 or yeah. something like that. And and you, oh, God, he's beaming. He's got yeah. warmth. There's, you know, I think he could sell that change. I think he'd be really good. For some reason, guys, I had like a, hmm, he's not my favourite actor, but like a Charlie Hanan kind of... <laughs> Like he's kind of a charismatic and charming, got by on his looks. <laughs> so I'm just imagining the amount of people who have prefixed bringing Charlie Hunnam into a uh, conversation with exactly what you said. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my favourite actor, but we could always call Charlie Hunnam, I suppose, man. <laughs> I suppose. Well, you certainly get a variety of accents, uh, if nothing else. Yes, yeah. <laughs> all in one sentence, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but actually, because I also do have a lot of time for Charlie Hunnam, and I think Hunnam, mm. uh, and I think that uh, Lost City of Z was amazing. And he performed his absolute ass off in that, and he can mm-hmm. give him the right. He's, yes, that's true. Blah blahs, and I think this would be a good opportunity for him to show some of that because he shows the same amount of obsession and drive in Lost City of Z yeah. that we need him to show with this. That's true. I'm really liking the the picture of Hunan and uh, and and uh, Henry together. It's working. Yeah, I can see I, that I, as a, I as think a pairing. That would work. I can see Charlie Hunan with like he's probably like way more up the ladder. Like he's a he's a general or something, so he's got the lion's mane kind of yes. skins. He's got the big armor and he's got the the lovely purple cloak and the, yeah. all yeah. that kind of thing. I can imagine. I think he could do and that. Like the hair, the sort of he's yeah. got hair like Cad file almost. All right, I think Ridley Scott, Henry Cavill, and Charlie Hunnam. I like that as a as a triangle of success for this movie. Mm. So that was oh. my huge epic pitch for Sicilian Defense. Dude. Uh, uh, thank you so much. I never expected, I never expected an epic out of that title. You've got a big fat green light over here. That was wonderful. Wonderful. I'm glad you like it. Well, may I please sit on the front row of the Mind Cinema and watch White Moonlight? All right. Fire, fire up them uh, projectors, Floyd. Off we go. Okay. White Moonlight. So. So it is 1993, Shepherd's Keep in Wilmington, UK. We're just in a nice sort of like uh, quiet, <laughs> sleepy suburb kind of a thing, man. We start uh, with a shot of some fingers pulling and tugging at the latch of a gate, which is all like gunged up with strings of bright pink chewing gum. And like hear this like, oh, you little shits, you absolute bastards. <laughs> the fingers belong to uh, Dickie Frond. <laughs> Uh, he's a recently... Dickie Frond. Dickie Frond. He's our, oh, I love your name. <laughs> he's our recently uh, early retired from the police force uh, lead character. Uh, he resides in Acorn Rise with his wife, Alice Frond. Uh, we're going to focus on like several houses in this lovely, sleepy cul-de-sac uh, of Acorn Rise, uh, primarily that of Dickie and his wife, Alice. And we follow him through to the back garden where there's a barbecue for the neighbourhood like happening in full swing. Uh, well... Full swing, the residents are kind of sat in twos and ones, talking kind of quietly while Dickie starts to rage uh, in the back garden, ready for another impromptu seminar about what the little delinquent shits those Walnut Grove kids are (laughs) up to. Jesus H. Christ, the other day I saw, and then Alice steps in and deftly, completely cuts him off. Come on now, Dickie, this coming from the same boy who thought he was the bloody Beatles, playing rooftop gigs on his college refectory. (laughs) Like, and Dickie starts to... And she's like, no, speaking of, let's get some music on. Audie, speaking to one of the other members of the uh, garden party, join me for a dance. 
And so we do a little tour of the garden. We've got Alice and Audi uh, starting to have some nice fun while Dickie stabs angrily at the coals of the barbecue. The music starts to spill out and fill the <laughs> quiet little pockets of this lovely garden. We see Malcolm Biddle sat chewing a hot dog, <laughs> uh, staring off into the flower beds, and he's just idly sort of running his fingers through the grass under his camping chair, letting his arm hang off and mm-hmm. just, just touch it, and he looks perfectly happy. We see Clem, Audie's partner, um, and their dog, Percy, little Percy, all frolicking about, having a lovely time. Uh, Clem officially ends the barbecue with a call of, oh, work tomorrow, oh, not you, Dickie, a life of leisure awaits. I'll see you at the watch meetings, mm-hmm. and he... Off he goes. And Dickie sort of seems to deflate a bit about the fact that he's got a life of leisure ahead of him. He sort of seems even more internalised and even more barbecue stoky as he's getting the last of the coals out and cleaning up. And he goes to wash up. He peers out the windows and he starts to talk about the kids. And he sees a van pull up and it sort of makes its way to the empty house at the bottom of the road. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. We've got a new neighbour to witness the decline of the street. Bloody brilliant. Yeah, well, welcome in. Welcome to the <laughs> shit house. I'll go and tell him my... And she's just like, right, for Christ's sake, man. Walks <laughs> away, leads him to his washing up, man. He's out of there. So this new resident is Quentin Bodmin Lawler. <laughs> and Dickie makes... <laughs> very strong point of walking past him the next morning to announce that he is the leader of the Acorn Rise Residential Protection Society. And Quentin is... uh, Yeah, odd. That's kind of... That's a bit pejorative. Um, But he's got a strange air about him. He's mannered. He seems somewhat baffled, but in a very uh, wonderfully baffled way by Dickie and all of his airs and graces and bluster. And he stretches out a hand and he holds it for what Dickie feels like a little bit too long. <laughs> and he just says, ah, a policeman. I feel safer already. Ho, ho. If I hadn't known, I'd say these were magicians' hand. And Dickie pulls his hand away and is like, what? I didn't say I was a policeman. And what are you talking about? Get off me. You... Anyway, we move on. We've, we've greeted him to the neighbourhood. Alice goes to work. Dickie goes to fish. That's the thing he can do when he's not chasing up Walnut Grove kids. He'll add to the never-ending supply of mackerel in the chest freezer out the back. He takes his massive rod from above the mount. Hey! Hey! <laughs> <laughs> and he helicopters it! <laughs> and he just, he's just swinging around the apartment, knocking things off, <laughs> man, getting more and more frustrated. <laughs> so he, he, he's got... He's got, he's got a massive rod. None of this is symbolic. <laughs> I think it all is symbolic, Graham. I've just realised all of this is symbolic. I've got problems, man. Don't read anything into the subtext of this story, guys. <laughs> he's kind of... He's, he's proud of his rod. He's got it mounted above his fireplace, man. It's his pride and joy. And it catches Pretty sturdy loads shaft. of mackerel with his big... It's common. Anyway, come on. Move on. So... So juvenile. So he gets his, his uh, fishing uh, uh, apparatus. Uh, <laughs> he gets his tackle out. <laughs> <laughs> now I understand why people fish. It's never been apparent. I've never talked about fishing with someone before, man. And now we're talking about fishing. It's fucking, it's amazing. It's just, it's, it's just lots uh, of genital jokes. <laughs> he gets his tackle out. Yes. So he goes and grabs his tackle uh, from above the mantle. <laughs> And he shoves his rod in the car. Shoves it right in the boot, in the trunk. Uh, I thought she was called Alice. <laughs> <laughs> you leave Mrs. Frond out of this. <laughs> She's suffered enough. <laughs> so he Sorry, jumps Karen. in like the car and like does like a sort of like Terminator style scan of the surrounding gardens for a sign of these kids, for a sign of a poo, for a sign of a bubblegum wrapper. And yeah. as he's driving out of the uh, little cul de sac, he has to swerve out of the way of Quentin and this like big sort of like, I don't know, pool installation truck. Like, you know, uh, Bert's little swimmers. No, no, not Bert's <laughs> little swimmers. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Never call the pool installation company that man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, dear. <laughs> so a swimming pool <laughs> installation truck uh, is right behind <laughs> Quentin and he has to swerve to get out of the way and Dickie's like, oh, pool eh? will mm. fuck me sideways. The noise of that getting dug, great, brilliant. He turns up the radio, hits the road and as he burns rubber, there's a familiar sort of song, the same song that 
him and Alice were sort of swaying to before he broke free the other night. Something about the moonlight. <laughs> and so with Dickie away, we get to see Quentin almost sort of gliding around the neighbourhood in his weird, strange, but very, very lovely and open way. He keeps popping in. Do you mind if I pop in? You know, I'm just going to pop over. He's that kind of a... <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. So he pops into those houses that have residents home that aren't at work, and each one, sort of like, during the handshake, a bit like he did with Dickie, sort of notices something. Like the dirt under Malcolm's fingers. Uh, Mr. Biddle, sorry. Uh, and he's like, oh, green fingers, ha! Huh? We have a creator, a curator in our mix. How marvellous. And then he goes over to Audie and Clem's house and he notices the way Audie has such a lovely way with words. And quite marvellous. I've been wrapped. Don't apologise for such tales, young man. Audie mentions Clem and his architecture and Quentin is gleeful at this point. He's getting so excited by seeing these passions. So all throughout these meetings, the handshake remains held, but the folks he's talking to and introducing themselves to, they don't seem to mind that at all like Dickie did. They're, they're, they're open, they're gladly sharing this, this enthusiasm that uh, Quentin is pouring out at the things breath, he notices. Breath of fresh air. Yeah, he's a lovely, wonderful, wonderful person. Not if you're Dickie, but to everyone else, he seems lovely. We now get a view of our first neighbourhood watch with Dickie holding court. Uh, he leaves, of course, with news of the pool. Most people are really excited and like up for it, and they're like, oh, we might even get an invite. This is amazing. We've just our first mm. pool. This is Acorn Rise's first pool. We've never had anyone who do such a thing over this. And he's like, look, yeah, it's not the pool. It's the, it's the noise the installing of the pool's going to make. And, like, mm. yeah, he's probably one of the bloody hippies from the 60s. He's probably one of those guys. Pampers yeah. grass. That's what's happening Pampers next. Pampers grass. Pampers yes. grass out the front. We're, we're a seedling or two away from Pampers grass and I won't have it. I think we should tell uh, to the listeners out there the... Fair point. The myth of Pampers grass. Is it a myth or is it a fact? I think like some do, it's a good signifier of something, Graham. It might not be a definitive, it's a good, Yes, but... there is. In this country or maybe in other countries I know, but specifically in this country around about the 70s late 60s 70s 80s in urban areas or the suburbs there was um if you saw a neighbor who had pampas grass outside the house then you were inclined to believe that <laughs> they're in their abode there lay swingers oh yeah it's a bountiful no. amount of free a bountiful amounts of swingers so if you ever see pampas grass outside somebody's house uh have a knock and see what happens. Enjoy. Yeah, go for it, guys. There's mm. no judgment here. Bring it on. <laughs> so that's what we mean, dear listeners, by yes, so thank you so much for, next. For, for, mm. Yeah, filling that up. And this is what, as understandably, <laughs> Dickie is terrified about. He doesn't want this to turn into yes, the last days of Sodom. Um, yeah, exactly. It's a cul-de-sac, for God's sake. It's acorn rise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He's got to protect it. So mm. we get to our first neighbourhood watch, as I say, mm -hmm. um, and he he immediately cuts off this pool excitement chat, man. He's like, no, nah, Quentin's a bad seed. He's bringing, it, bringing the neighbourhood down. Look, anyway, good news, everyone. It's been a two-mess weekend. And he flips a big old chart, and on this flip chart, he's got little, like, diagram of the cul-de-sac and he's got like little <laughs> magnetic stickers of poos and bubblegum wrappers and things like this that he's made that he's Amazing. positioning all over the place as he says goodbye to the neighbors he cranes his head over at quentin's home quentin is playing that bloody song you can hear treat me right the girl rising white moonlight the sound's mm. just about reaching Dickie and Alice, and she starts to sway and boogie a little bit next to Dickie, man. And, like, the arm comes round, and they cosy up a little bit. And then he sort of comes to, marches them inside, slams the door shut. Ah, music and a pool installation. Well, this bloke is a real catch, isn't he? <laughs> we drift over to Quentin's. We follow, let the camera follow over to his. And the music's getting louder, and it's starting to swell, and we're starting to hear white moonlight in its uh, all of its glories for the mm. first time as it's taking us the, the camera onto this journey over the top of uh, Quentin's house. He's sat outside, humming, lost in reverie, next to his brand new pool that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Interesting. Uh, and the camera takes a walk around the block, and we get to see the neighbours reacting to the music as it drifts in through their open windows in this lovely summer's summer's eve. Mm. And we see uh, uh, Alice upstairs in their house and she's kind of grooving out to the music and she's also listening for the sound of Dickie going out for his evening patrol. Then we see two fingers in a shot very similar <laughs> to the one at the start of the movie uh, above the latch of a gate. Mm. And we see these fingers take some gum and shove it deep inside the latch, mirroring completely the shot at the start of the film. 
and we pan up and we reveal Dicky mashing the gum as deep as he can into the mm. latch of the gate and looking off in the distance. And then we follow him as he sneaks around the neighbourhood, leaving a trail of petty destruction and small-time chaos, ready to fuel his next wonderful oration on these okay. in Walnut Grove kids. So Dickie has another meeting. And uh, the flip jar's out again. He's raging. He's listening to all of the vandalism caused by the kids. And he's left a pretty good trail mm. this time. The stickers on the border off the hook, man. And he starts to try and turn the neighbourhood watch against Quentin. The residents say there are more things to worry about. We've got bloody some awful graffiti that was scrawled over the entry fencing. And at this point, like, Dickie gets a bit upset. He's like, what the fuck? I put a bit of time into that graffiti, man. I was doing, I thought I'd done quite a <laughs> job in his head. We just see him, like, get, like, really, like, defensive about it. And he's just, he's, like, he's desperate for, like, this, this recognition. It's, it's, yeah. But he can't step Amazing. forward and ask for it out front, <laughs> man. He's got to come up with these crazy ways, man. <laughs> and he gets really okay. offended. The guys are even yeah. more on board with Quentin than before. Uh, and then Dickie's like, right, there's nothing else I can do, man. Uh, and we, we cut back to Dickie in his element. And he is, of course, uh, shining up his rod <laughs> and uh, putting some feather flights onto his uh, hooks and just getting himself ready for another fishing session because again that's kind of all he's got bless his heart he's zoning in and he's listening mm. to the music that he loves so much we know he did he used nice. to play on ruse for goodness sake man and true to form quentin stumbles across dickie singing like this mm. ah i hear a true calling forgive my earwigging of course but what a sweet sound you make <laughs> please please go on <laughs> and then quentin starts to hum the melody for the White Moonlight song that we've heard. Mm -hmm. And we see Dickie sort of just start to groove on, man, and he starts to join in, and he starts to get kind of full voice, man, and, like, the headphones are off the back of the head at this point, man, and he's giving it some flipping welly when some actual kids from Walnut Grove turn up and they start taking a massive piss about these two old guys singing to each other, <laughs> man. Kids, toss up! Laugh at him and Quentin, stood there <laughs> singing to each other, we know bastards, eh, get on their BMXs, yeah, 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 yeah. They got, I don't know what they were writing. <laughs> they were, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, tiny little enthusiastic other kids, I guess, that they rode yeah, into okay. the group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so um, the next night, like, and, and, and Dickie takes this, like, he's really, he almost feels guilty for blaming all the stuff on the Walnut Groves kids, so he can't even really be angry at them, man. He's kind of a bit of him's like, oh, I guess I sort of maybe deserve some of this, because I... <laughs> but Quentin, man, Quentin's the one that made me do that. Mm. And it's it, like, he's the one that fucking... So he's like, right, I'll keep blaming them. I've, I've got to get this guy out, man, because he's he's my new little fixation. It was, it was like, just looking yeah. after the Grove. Now I've got an actual problem I can get involved with, man, like, or I can make for myself that's way more meaningful to me because now my feelings are actually involved. So he breaks in to Quentin's garden. So, well, maybe a little bit of sabotage. I'll bring him a, down a peg or two like he brought me down. Not really sure what he's going to do but he wants to do something. He's not, he's, and he's kind of also aware that this is maybe not the sanest thing that he's done in his life. And it's, but. It, but it's, it's important. It is, it's important. And it's, and it's kind of the only important at the moment as well. Mm. So as he's going in, he can sort of like see Quentin bobbing around in the background. Uh, he's a, uh, uh, He's slowly creeping his way in. Quentin's going and turning lights off. So he's getting more cover in the back garden. He goes up to the pool. And they're sort of like we hear the song playing again. Quentin's obsessed with it, man. Mm. And Dickie's crawling along, and he's like, "Well, I can, I can, I could, I could, I could, I could, I could wee wee in the pool. I guess I could wee in the pool." <laughs> And that's the best he's got. Yeah. So he goes to mm, unhook himself and do the business in there. And he slips and he falls. And the second he hits the pool, and uh, nothing, and there's a void. Oh my day! And we're going a little bit under the skin. Twisty times. Under skin, you know when they are being yeah. brought into the layer, and we get that sort of like the blank Terrifying. pool of nothingness, that kind of a thing. And then, He's fallen into Broomfield's cave. He absolutely has. So he slips into a pool. You've got this weird mm. under the skin style. <laughs> And he's in nothing. And like just in the back, that muffled. <laughs> and this world starts to sort of materialize around him, like a roughly hewn stage of sorts, and what looks like the back of warped leather seats in front of him. 
and an instrument of sorts materialises in his hands and his fingers seem to slip into place and he's kind of blanked and shocked but his hand moves down and hits the strum sort of just and we see these sort of like warped leather seats start to creak and turn and they start to reveal these really abstract twisted faces and these mouths open in the centre of each of them and they start to sort of like moan and undulate and Dicky screams. He wakes up in the middle of the pool, thrashing around, bubbles everywhere, swims to freedom, out the back, leaves a big old soggy mark across the back garden of uh, Audie and Clems as he escapes out of the broken fence and he runs home terrified. So now he is seriously fixated on Quentin's house. And he's, he's there and he's looking and you can see Audie wandering over to Quentin's house and we see Quentin lure Audie in and there's a little bit of back and forth and then Audie disappears and over through the threshold of the house. And then we cut to Audie and Quentin inside and Quentin hits play on the record player and that song starts coming. Come with me, baby, treat me right. We'll all raise up in that white moonlight. But he's like, just come through, come through to the back garden, Audi. He's showing off the pool, telling him to make himself uh, completely at home. Would you like to slip in? You are most welcome to. Oh! <laughs> Audi does. He gives himself a sweet plunge into the under the skin style pool. But unlike Dickie's crazy, the fear, the, the overexposure, things happen much more gently. We've got Quentin's voice in the background, just gently soothing him. We're not even really sure what he's saying. We just hear that whole... Do we go into the pool with um, Audie? We're in with Audie, man. Yeah, we're going in for a second look at the pie. So he takes a sweeter plunge into the pool and you've got Quentin's voice and you hear it just like mumbled, mumbled and that whole that he does is sort of punctuates it every now and again and the song playing gently and Quentin, you can hear him now come through and say, let's go on, tell me a tale, tell all you like. And all around Audie materialises this world full of like sighing swaying grass and the second he opens his mouth to start to speak they all sway towards him and they're sort of swaying back mm. and forward and start to get in with the rhythm of his speaking as he opens his mouth and starts to feel good man they start to release these little chirrups as he starts talking and as he talks the grasses start to grow and grow and as the grasses grow these giant creatures bigger than uh, gods start to bow their heads down and take great mouthfuls of the grass and they start to huff with pleasure at it and Audie's just sat in their shadows giddy beaming, lost in reverie, and it is a beautiful experience. And he comes out of the pool and he wraps his arms around Quentin and he weeps and he just says, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Dickie sees him leave. He looks fucking loopy, Alice. What the <laughs> hell is he doing over there? I, uh, a, that's definitely going on the poster. <laughs> White moon, like, they're fucking loopy. <laughs> <laughs> And that, and he's like, he looks off his head. He looks like he's on something. I bet he's he's, he's got stuff in there, man. And the song's coming out of the front door as, as Audie's leaving, and Alice is singing along, and she's staring off a little bit into space, singing along to it. And she's just like, what scares you about fun, Dicky? You push away all the things you should be holding tight, love. So the next Neighbourhood Watch meeting, we've got Audie. He's effusing about the trip in the pool. He says it's the best thing that's ever happened to him. He doesn't give details as such, but... Tears clearly come into his eyes as he says how wonderful it was. Clem hugs him. Uh, Dickie's scared. He doesn't quite know why. Not just because of Audie and what he saw, but because he's, he's lost control of the group. And no one gives a monkeys mm. about anything that's being laid anywhere anymore. He can, they're planning their trips to the pool, man. They are all busy planning those trips to the pool when he just shouts, Percy's been shitting again! And then he just fucking storms out and leaves everyone just sat there like... We're seeing now the residents start to file in, showing them being guided into the pool by Quentin, seeing these amazing, we'll have an amazing montage of these pool outings, this completely outlandish imagery. And we see <sighs> Dicky, his silly boy, graffitiing, kicking in a fence more. And we see him spotting a bag of cement. And so he empties the lot into Quentin's pool. The next neighbourhood watch meeting, he goes to... Uh, goes to go over to Audie's house to uh, chair it and he sees through the window that Quentin's present and he just about turns and walks straight back to his place. Well, inside, the others are obviously gathering around Quentin, pledging they will help to clean up the pool. So they have a pool cleaning party and Dickie watches from between the slats, hears that song playing and 
and the neighbours are laughing and the pool's starting to splash and starting to be used and it feels good. And he goes back to his house to watch and listen and see the little flashes of light and hear the splashes and the laughter and then he, it all goes quiet and that bloody song comes on again. And he sees everyone leave bar Alice. She wants to bury the hatchet with Quentin, man. And as always, Quentin is as lovely and as uh, accommodating as possible. And ha ha ho, we did clean the pool. It would be silly not to use it, you and I. Mm. She takes a trip too. Now we're going to have, this is where we get sort of like to some reveals and whatnot. They will be having uh, a, another big old shindig um, at Quentin's. And mm -hmm. as they come out, um, they're going to catch uh, Dickie with a couple of Ziploc bags, with a couple of poos in. And he's starting to like <laughs> place them on lawns now uh, to try okay. this last ditch like effort at getting some kind of uh, some kind of uh, attention from everyone. We all know. We know what you're doing. What you're doing, man. Like mm. it's not weird over there. It is weird, but it's not weird. It feels right. It feels good. Come here. Come join us, man. He's like, I'm no, I'm not having any of it, man. He's going back to fishing or whatever. And so. Now Quentin is going to gather the guys from the uh, from the neighbourhood, and he's going to say like, "Now we have all been on journeys. We have all mm -hmm. I think enjoyed these journeys. We got your how do you put it? Uh, oh, the invitation you sent. Please join me in the pool." And so they start to get into the pool, and we start to see flashes of the contents of Voyager ah. and what is on the golden disc, and hearing. These, seeing all of these beautiful creations that we sent up into space to say, mm -hmm. all right, look what we can do. And fair enough, that's kind of amazing, you know? And we sent this this little beacon of hope out into nothingness. We certainly With did. beautiful music and, and uh, ingenuity and uh, all of the wonderful aspects yeah, that we the best of us, right? Exactly that, man. And he says, we, we received your invitation. We received it joyfully we accept and we'd like to extend one back back right back at you guys we recognize like your talents within that and they seem so in line with our own and we create and we fix and we help and we go on to say how he is sort of an emissary of sorts sent to collect those who want to join and we will all travel oh think of it think of it mm. and the joys you felt in the little tests that we've given these adventures that they're, they're only the start we're all cogs out of place. Uh, some of us spin freely and alone and need others to give them purpose. And you'll be safe, you'll be useful. And they're getting hit by imagery now of the planets they visited and the seeds that they have sown coming to life and the creatures and they're spanning over the, the great landscapes that they have barely even touched and, and feeling that happiness again and feeling that draw and that satisfaction, that beyond primal, it's firing straight into the good bit of the stomach where the love's kept, man. Mm. The, the song, like, forgive me, I'm sure you're all <laughs> slightly bored of by now, but it's a primer. It's as much a primer as it is a divining rod, and it kind of seeks out those who will most benefit this work, and it opens up your minds a bit, and it allows a slower progression into these worlds, unlike poor Dickie, and he gives him sympathy, bless his heart, because he's like, I know he went in unguided, and he probably... He had no context, he had nothing to help him, and he just saw crazy creatures screaming just at fell him. In. Yeah. And that is not, he did not, he, he did not go to the right place, he went to a place. Mm. So, at this point, I, I'm <laughs> kind of a, a fork in the road, because okay. we've got Dickie is going to come back. I think we'll, we'll, we'll see him fishing, um, and we'll hear him starting to hum again. And we'll, mm -hmm. we'll have the radio switch on in the car that's parked by the side of the river mm -hmm. and white moonlight comes on and he starts to really give it proper welly this time, man. And like tears start streaming down his cheeks as he's nice. bellowing, bellowing out into the river on his own, but as if he's in front of the audience that he was so terrified by previously, man. Something sort of clicks into place, maybe. And then he's going to go back um, and he's going to witness the pool that everyone is in this, this blast of what only looks like solidified white moonlight is going to fly down and hit this pool. And it kind of captures it and it starts to lift mm. the, the entire body of water upwards like a big old jelly with people in it. <laughs> and Dickie sees this and he's like, so this is where 
uh, I, I, what I think I want to happen to be happy and lovely mm-hmm. and to like plug into some of the cocoon vibes that I got going on here yeah. and not plug into some of the close s- encounters kind of thing. Right. So, what I kind of want him to do is to go grab his uh, fishing rod <laughs> from the back of the car. I want him to cast yeah. it up and catch Quentin somehow with it. And then he'll hoist mm. himself up and he'll be, take me with you, take me with you, take me with you. And Quentin and mm, everyone. It's a bit hokey. It is pretty hokey, man. But it's like I'm going with like the cocoon kind of vibes because my alternative to this, this is where uh, the little mischievous uh, black fingernail painting goth Luke was like. <laughs> and then we see everyone inside that pool get fucking vaporized and turn like dissolved into like food for whatever <laughs> this being is up in the moon. Right. And. <laughs> And this is happening, like, all over the world. We pan out and lots of people are just getting sucked up in these bodies of water that have been tricked by these emissaries. So that was, like, that was a that was where mm. the naughty part of me wanted to go. I think... But I want more hope and niceness to occur. The man. dark ending is a bit of a cop-out. I don't... And I don't want that. That's not... I prefer the nicer version. Me too, man. Definitely. I've got a very hokey ending. Okay, you want a hokey ending? It. Yeah, of course, man. I've got I've got a guy fishing an alien and going to space. So yes, I do, man. This is the <laughs> right, primo so, time for it. Hokey ending. They the they go up into the the cocoon like spaceship to, to explore the paradise of their new adventures. He's left behind now, and he's left with the empty uh, swimming pool. So what he does is the next night he goes there and he gets his guitar and he sits in the pool and he starts to play. Nothing happens. He goes, he starts to play White Moonlight. Still nothing happens. And then eventually he gets his box that he's had, which we can set it up earlier, of mm-hmm. like percussive instruments, tambourines. Or, and he rounds up the Bass Street kids and he has a no. jamboree. <laughs> he has a jamboree in the pool and they all play along and he teaches them all White Moonlight. And then the beam comes back and they all go up. Yes. That's my hokey ending. Yeah, uh, yeah. we'll just take him because I don't want to kidnap kids. They they haven't yeah, got enough, enough. Uh, exposure. We'll just take him. Well, yeah, we can do like an ET ending. Like they help him to go up. They believe him because they've seen this or something. They help him to go up. Yeah, but, yeah. Like, well, the idea, be... like, he's seen this and he's very lonely, but he knows that it's he wants it. He's yeah, not, but he's... he wants to go, he wants to explore. He's ready for it. When he sees them go up and then he tries to hook on, it's not from a sense of don't leave me alone or what's happening is the like it's the take me with you i'm ready yeah yeah this yeah, is yeah. euphoria yeah. i get it now i understand yeah. and then that's denied him and he has to find another way which is to actually just be yourself and sing loudly in your garden with your guitar or stand on the maybe he does it on the roof or something yeah, he tries yeah, yeah. He, he just does tries it on the roof these weird things the pool, man definitely yeah and yeah, then beam, yeah. It gets beamed up in a lovely cocoon ending and that is white moonlight and that's white moonlight baby Oh, I loved it. That was so sweet and terrifying and weird. That's very British as well. That's got a nice... Yeah, I wanted it to feel like very, very... Uh, and I've cast uh, like a pretty give or take of rather a uh, British cast, maybe one American, maybe. We'll talk about it kind of a thing. But I wanted to have that feel, man. I really liked the... He had a really good British sensibility to it with a bit of horror, but that also stepped over into some American-style suburban dread lynching thing i think i thought it was a really nice marriage of the two it was nearly a set in 50s suburbia i think that was kind of, you know it was that yeah, kind I of a see that. thing going on man starman that was another touch point for a movie that was you know yes starman's a great example kind of, yeah yeah um so we got some casting man let's get some, some faces casting. into the mind cinema to go with the story all right who you got so I was thinking uh, for Dickie Fromm, and he is recently yes. retired, remember, and I think that this is age appropriate. I was going to go for like a Ben Chaplin, man. Oh, nice. Okay. I've de-aged him slightly from retirement, which is like 73. Sorry, but... yeah. So I was thinking like forces, like early retirement. 50s. Yeah, and I think Chaplin's probably okay. he's hitting around there now. Uh, he looks amazing. He does. It's Ben Chaplin, and I'm glad we finally got a role for Ben Chaplin in this podcast. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a few. Okay, Ben Chaplin's a great shout for Dicky. Uh, that was kind of all I had for Dicky, man. Have you got anyone else uh, okay. on, on the cards for Dicky? I have Reese Shearsmith. Oh, 
<laughs> He'd be able to do finickety so he well. He will get the button down frustrated. He's done it again, and no one can do that button down English repression better than Rishi Smith. And yep. then from that, for Quentin or for um, Malcolm or Audie, I've got the rest of the League of Gentlemen. Oh. So Steve Pemberton and Mark Gates is like a reunion of these guys. I can imagine them playing off each other. I thought Pemberton would be a good Quentin. Yeah. But he'd yes. also be quite a good Audie. I think he'd be a good Audi. I'd like him to be an Audi, I think, man. He's mm-hmm. got that like that 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 orator's warmth about him. Yeah. Uh okay, yeah, I've got uh Alice Sally Hawkins. Um yep. and Standard. then for Quentin Bodmin Lawley, uh I was thinking Tilda Swinton, maybe. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Or John Malkovich, if we were gonna go slightly weird, but he's too weird because <laughs> he is an alien. Let's so. play cards. <laughs> I've got um, <laughs> um, I've got Richard E. Grant. Oh, E. Grant. E. e by E. Ek. Yeah, he'd be good. For Alice, yep. I've got you had Sally Hawkins, I had Alice Lowe. Oh. Because I think she could do the exasperation and the and the clean cut kind of you you're being an idiot. And the and the, the kind of thing, wonder like, and happiness and uh, director wise, like this all depends on budgets, obviously. I've got four. Four. I've got um <laughs> I've got three. The first one, <laughs> I think Luke had had a toddy or something at this point. Um <laughs> uh, I was like Ken Loach. Uh because he has done like the Angel Share, he's done these light, beautiful, frivolous kind of films as much as he's done mm. his very serious uh serious, you know, polemics kind of a thing. Do yeah. I mean Ken Loach or do we mean Mike? Mm. Mike Lee. I don't think Mike Lee's much sunnier. Anyway, Luke was having a toddy. <laughs> Let's dis- just let, let discounting it. I'm saying it because it's written there. I'm doing an anchor man. I'm just saying what's written in front of me. So as a let's clear our palettes, uh, I was thinking maybe Paul King, who did Bunny in the Bull. Yes, yeah, I've got, yeah, he'll be lovely. And the Paddington films, obviously, he captures that brilliant, wonderful and happiness quaint. and joy and yeah. just celebrations, man. Uh, or oh, maybe, then, we, uh, then, then yeah. we can get Hugh Grant as Quentin. Oh. He will do that. So yeah, wonderful, yeah, 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 so yeah. sinister, and so charming, and so <laughs> and wonderful. delicious, and delicious. And I want to not trust him. I want to not trust him, even when people are. But then trust him at the end when he's the alien. So I'm going to take you to some beautiful places. I mean, it's going to yeah. be fine. Absolutely, yeah, and and yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. okay, Jim right. Grant, uh, and then maybe Michelle Gondry. I was thinking because we could make mm, all of these yes. great planets could just be made literally yeah. in these ad hoc, beautiful way that he does. Michel Gondry's a great shout. And he's got that fantasy and he doesn't apologise for his fantastical flights of fancy and that's kind of what we'd need for this, I yeah, think. Yeah, absolutely, that is a good shout. So so I think out of all of those, I, I'm, I'm backing Michel Gondry for this. I think that's an, okay. an, inspired, I think that's an inspired shout. The, the weird handmade, lovely worlds that they go into and the... Uh, in-camera strange uh, effects he would generate, whether as they're falling into the pool and going into the. Okay, right. Well, we'll we'll send we'll we'll talk to his team. We'll send out some feelers. Okay. That is amazing. There we go, dude. Thank you so much for the casting as well. Cheers, dudes. There we go. I what moonlight, it. everyone. Sugar. This is kind of bringing us to to the close of things. The proceedings I are wrapping up. I guess it is. I guess it is. I guess the only thing left to do is to choose some horses. Let's choose some horses. Where are you going to take me on a date for the horses? I am going to take you to uh, a lovely place called Thursk for the six o'clock. Okay. For the British EBF Maiden Stakes. Six o'clock at Thursk. Okay, let me have a little browse. And some lovely horses... I would like to give you Jones Angel. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. I absorbed. That's in there. Thank you very much, mate. Uh, in return, I'm going to give you... I nearly went in... <laughs> so I nearly went Oliver <laughs> then. I'm going to give you that. Uh, Starlight Stanley. Because it's Starlight Stanley. That's the uh, maybe want to talk like that. Blue me luck. <laughs> So, yeah, sorry, without any accent other than mine own uh, mm. original one, Starlight Stanley for you, sir. Starlight Stanley, okay. I've got... All right. I've got an idea. 
OK, Starlight Stanley, I like that. OK, fantastic. Well, first, Graham, thank you so much for mm. that. Thank you for the, thank the you. in every ways epic that you pitched. That was brilliant. <laughs> um, and thank you guys out there for listening, as always. And we hope you're all doing really well uh, and enjoying yeah. yourselves as much as we're enjoying ourselves. Uh, yes. And, of course, feel free to drop us a line. We've got um, racehorse movies, all one word, at the Never Press, all one word, uh, dot com. So thank you all so much. And uh, I guess we're going to wrap things up. And until next week, guys, take it very easy. Take care of yourselves. Uh, lots of love from us both. Cheers for listening. And we'll see you soon in the Mind Cinema. Bye-bye. Love you. Bye. Well, there we have it. Another episode of Racehorse Movies is over. We both hope you had as much fun listening as we did coming up with these films and recording our pitches. If you enjoyed this, please share it around with your friends and loved ones. If it wasn't your thing, I don't know, maybe share it with someone you miffed with. Who knows? If it's not for them either, maybe you two can build some bridges over that connection. But if you did like picking up what we put down and you fancy checking out some more content from us, then head over to theneverpress.com to take a gander at our novels, poetry and other bits and bobs. Anyway, that's about enough from us. Hope to have you back next time for some friendly chats and barely thought through pitches at Racehorse Movies. Ta-ta! Bye.